All right. Welcome, everyone. This is day three on our um, SARE 30 Days Challenge. So the first two days, we had Calvin Chin come and talk to us about different ideas on how to get into real estate and what's going on in the market. So while that's it's a long-term game on making money, at the same time, there's also another way of making money in terms of tax savings. And so to round up our event for this for this um, year, actually, this is the last webinar of the year before I go on winter break. <laughs> so I'm going to have Tony talk about tax saving strategies that we can implement starting the new year. All right, take it away, Tony. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Annie. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Tony Hong, um, founder of the CPA Dude. Um, we're a tax strategy firm, um, so I'll help people save taxes, file taxes, um, stay out of jail. As uh, so always, the uh, is the goal there. So yeah, tonight's agenda is just overall year end tax planning, and what can you be doing in the next uh, twenty four days here? Um, yeah, so next twenty four days, what can you do? So still got some time left, not a ton of time left. Um, so let's start with what you can do. Um, so before you go into any of this, you want to know what's your adjusted gross income. Um, so like one, like, do you know how much you made this year or not? Um, shockingly, when I hop on discovery calls, some people don't even know. I'm like, nice. You make uh, too much money. <laughs> I need to join your ranks. Um, so one, what's your adjusted gross income? Um, so from your W2 or if you have a business and or of course, um, you got your real estate. So um, W-2 is easy, pull your most recent pay stub, and that's going to be how much your, um, you have from W-2, but then your rental properties and your business. Um, so this is where everyone um, never does anything. Uh, so it's bookkeeping. Uh, so <laughs> everyone's uh, most hated thing uh, and no one wants to ever pay for it and they're, you know, have time to do it. So there's never any bookkeeping to be done. So right now, I'd say just from a year end cleaning side, if you haven't done your books for the whole year, um, time to get off your asses and time to do it. Um, if not, hire someone. Um, so just a pay to play type of game. So I always joke and say like people always, you know, come in and underwrite, analyze the hell out of deals. Um, but then when it comes to bookkeeping and seeing the performance of the deal, they don't know. I'm like, all right, cool. I think they just like cool rents in checks in moving right along. So actually go do your bookkeeping and then same time for your receipts. Um, so one question that I always get is like, do I need the receipt or not? And the question, like the answer is that you should have the receipt um, and you don't have to hold on to the physical copy, but when you do have it, um, I would recommend taking a picture of it. And then, you know, um, tip here is how to set up and save your receipts. So I'd say, you know, start a Google drive folder put it the parent as the year. And then the next part would be um, put your property name. And then every time that you um, have a receipt, take a picture and then throw it into that respective folder. So that way you have a copy for it. And then if you ever get audited, then you'd be like, cool property, bang, pull it out and you got it done. So that's the best case scenario. Um, I know not everyone has receipts or know this information before. So then alternatively, you know, save your bank statement or credit card statement in that same folder. So just have some type of support, some type of backup. Um, that may not be enough. Um, there's some auditors out there. It's a uh, box of chocolates of who you get for an auditor. Um, so sometimes you got some auditors, will they take bank and credit card statements? Uh, and then you got the other like ego driven folks where they won't. <laughs> And they think they have so much authority and be like, nope, uh, they won't let you have the deduction because you don't have the actual receipt. So just have that handy. Um, so keep track of your receipts now. And then if you're the type to save all the receipts in the shoebox, um, probably right now is the time to um, start inputting them into Google Sheet um, or do yourself a favor and just get some bookkeeping system. So, you know, you can front for uh, QuickBooks. Um, you can front our Wave apps is free. Um, what else is there? Fresh books, zero. Um, Stessa, I think they, they they cashed out and charge now. So they used to be free. Um, but it's better just to have some system um, because when you have to say go pull your income statements and you want to go apply for a loan, they're gonna be like, oh, hey, how's the business performing? How's the rent rentals performing? And generally you don't have it. <laughs> um, or if you do, then you're scrambling, but 
we all know how loans go. You need those, you know, need docs ASAP. Um, so that's bookkeeping. Um, I think every call I always come on and sound like a broken record and I always say the same exact thing, uh, but still no one does it. A and he got it down though. Like she's got the VA system in place now. So, you know, it's good. It took me three years though, after yeah. working with you to really set up the system. Like that's why my nickname for you has been Sir Tax Kryptonite for the, for the longest time. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you really get out of me. Yeah, definitely. So um, that, and then um, there is actually a side project that I'm working on with a, um, a buddy. He actually met him from Sarah, who became friends. Um, if anyone wants, we're trialing it out. It's just an idea right now, um, but it's a AI um, bookkeeper that we're piloting. Um, so it's in like just development. We're just working on it, getting gathering interest before we go full blown. Um, dude's a software engineer. So, um, but if anyone wants to be a guinea pig um, for it, um, we're just kind of taking user feedback and what they'd be interested in, what features, price point, all that. Um, so just shoot me a message on Messenger. Actually, I'm super behind. Um, email me, Tony at the CPA dude.com. So, um yeah <laughs> um so yeah contact me i'll be happy to trial that out and um you know get more ideas and feedback from that side um but anyways just because like i was brainstorming with him i'm like god damn it no one does bookkeeping <laughs> like can an ai just do it for people and then we're like can we build it or not well, um what's your idea on that like because the ai is answering questions would it be up helping with uploading or something like that so the idea would be to get bank statements and credit card statements, run it through the AI, and then have a set of financials ready. So that's the overall premise and the idea. Um, however, there's always adjustments. Um, so like, say if you get a PM statement, then it throws a crux into it. So that's why it's a pilot idea to see if we can scale it up or not. But from a generic business side, so say if you just have a brick and mortar business or econ business, super easy because there's no PM statement. Because PM statements actually act as your mini bank. And then, um, oh, speaking of which, for everyone here, if you use a PM, actually review and get the year to date on it and um, make sure everything flows out correctly. So those PM statements are one thing, but uh, does it dive, tie back to your cash and then also tie back to your 1099 MISC that you're going to be getting? And then if you're using a PM, um, another thing to do right now is if you had LLCs created since then and you want that 1099 MISC to go there, um, update your W-9s with your uh, PMs, just as a heads up, because they will be issuing your 10-9 MISCs for your rents in uh, January. So kind of a good time to do that right now. All right, perfect. Um, and then uh, speaking of these uh, house cleaning items, get documents in place ready is, you know, if you have your HUD or ULTA statements um, for the properties that you closed, um, great time to just find it <laughs> um, versus just scrambling for it. Um, so it's always like items when you need from tax time that you may or may not have. Um, if anyone had a kid this year, um, also go find their SSN. Um, <laughs> I, I sometimes like ask people like they had a new kid. I'm like, oh, congrats. And then like, you know, what's their full name? And what's their date of birth? And then SSN and they never can find the SSN. And then they'll have to contact the uh, Social Security Administration to get that. Um, so better just to start now uh, to get that ready. Oh, and then another thing too. Man, I didn't have, my list was not this big, but um, things are just popping in my head. Um, is probably secure um, your tax software or your tax advisor. Um, so there's a lot of um, deals, I think, uh, like TurboTax and H&R Block that run right now. That's like, I think their software is normally like half off during this time. Um, and then also um, for your own CPAs, um, tax preparers, whoever, lock in a spot with them now. Um, I haven't sent out our, like, <laughs> hey, are you coming back next year? Email, I just assume uh, most people will. I think Annie and Danny will be there at least. <laughs> so I got two customers. Um, so we got that going. So, you know, lock in your spot now because, um, you know, we're about going to close out our roster in January anyways. So uh, I'm sure other CPAs are going to be in that spot too. Um, so yeah, lock in that spot. And then if you're going to self-prepare, you know, get a deal on software. It's like half off right now. Um, so some more house cleaning items. Um, K1s is your next part. So if you have, uh, if you invested into a K1 um, or partnership of some sort, you want to make sure that your information is correct. So um, if you moved since you originally signed up, um, you want to make sure that that partnership has your latest and greatest address. 
um, two um, on that K-1. Do you expect any income to come from it or not? Um, so have that ready for, for your projection. Um, and then also number three, get expectations of when you're going to get that K-1. So if you think that the K-1 will come, or uh, your expectation is that you want to file your taxes by 415, and you haven't talked to who that partnership is, and when that K-1 is going to come, nine times out of 10, that K-1 is going to come in the summer, and you're going to extend, um, or late in November, uh, September, because it's due 915. So um, generally speaking, um, I see a ton of extensions for K-1s. Um, so they'll extend by 315 and you won't have anything. So plan for an extension on your side um, by 415. And um, the big thing that gets people into hot water is that they, um, when you extend, the taxes are actually still due 415. So you need to do a projection um, or just make your best guess. Uh, just toss in as much as you want and whatever the delta is between the time you extended and filed and you have a shortfall, then you have a penalty. Um, so that's uh, you know a key part and kind of leads into the overall part where I want to say, hey, do a tax projection. So um, yeah, let me see here. Let me answer some quick questions now. Let's go back to the, the K-1 stuff and then the yep. dead things. Um, can you first, Brianna, ask what is a K-1? Um, what type of investors would usually get one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Great question. Oh, nice to see you again. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so a K-1 is when you invest into like a partnership, a syndication, a fund, or you and a couple of buddies buy um, um, property together, then you're required to file a 1065 tax return. And that's like the equivalent of your 1040, but for a business. Um, so what that happens is that you'll get a 1065 tax. Uh, the business entity needs to file a 1065 tax return. And then all the members of it have to get a um, K-1 and then it's just like a little form that goes on top of your 1040 though. So think about it as a W-2, but um, a K-1 is the equivalent for having a partnership. And then going back onto um, the K-1 and the deadlines for your filing taxes. So you mentioned that sometimes syndications, they can file an extension until March to give it to you. But if the deadline with our tax return, um, is, what is it October 15th? what are we supposed to do? Do we still file the taxes or, but what, how, how do I wait until them giving it to me in March? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, so if they don't extend and they actually file it on time, they'll give it to you by three fifteen. Um, however, they may extend and then you can't file your own taxes until you get that K one. So it's actually like a, a bottleneck. Um, it's like a domino. If that K one domino doesn't fall, then your 1040 doesn't fall. So you need to just wait. Um, so anyone getting into partnerships, um, syndications, any of the sort. Um, and then as the more complex your portfolio gets, generally speaking, you'll always extend your taxes. There's like a point of no return <laughs> afterwards because like the bigger um, the bigger companies, um, they'll just extend your tax returns just because they're at bigger firms. So it used to be when I worked at KPMG, you would uh, you would do whoever the highest paying client is and then extend everyone else. <laughs> um, so that's how it works in like, you know, big public accounting side. And then you just die during the summer finishing up everything. So just, you know, knowing how bigger firms work. Then if I can't file my taxes until that March of that year, since that K-1's not there, what's my penalty? Am I going to get in trouble with IRS or something um, like yeah, so if you're the partnership in itself, so we'll go over partnership and then the 1040. So if you're the partnership and you have an LLC, a multi-member LLC, not a single member LLC, if you have a multi-member LLC, um, you need to file an extension by 315 or file the return by 315. Um, if you don't file the um, extension by then, then it is, oh boy, I think the rate keeps on going up, but it's 75, 70, give or take $10, I forget. Um, but seventy dollars per partner per month, um, so <laughs> it, it it adds up a ton. Um, there was a new client that came to us, and they had it was pretty cool. Um, oh, it was actually someone's uh, it was a Sarah member's cousin. Um, they have a crane game shop. Um, it's dope. Um, yeah, you know who, <laughs> Annie. Yeah, uh, if anyone's in Texas, check them out. That's dope. Um, but they just got started, and then um, they didn't file their partnership return, and then they got a three thousand nine hundred sixty dollar penalty. And then um, I called the IRS and I was just like, yo, dude, first year business, they didn't know better. 
and then they waived it. Um, so if your partnership does forget, um, call the IRS, it'll take forever. Um, you'll get timed out. Um, I think I had to call twice over like three days because um, it times out after 60 minutes. Um, so what first thing you do when you wake up at 7 a.m. is call the IRS. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a great life to be a CPA. Um, and then you just pray to God you don't get disconnected and get through. But if you do get a hold of them, you can ask for it's um, first time penalty abatement. Um, ask for that. So that goes on your 1040 return too. If you forget or something and it's a very large amount, like it's your get out of jail free card, um, you can call the IRS and ask for an abatement. They'll never waive the penalties or uh, the interest, sorry, but the penalty they may. So just keep that as a reminder for everyone here. Cool, cool. All right. All right. So let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay. Hire a VA. Annie says, yeah, VAs are great, um, especially for bookkeeping. Um, hopefully our bookkeeping AI will go. Devin, yeah, we'll talk to you here soon. I like that. Um, Victor, all right. Cost seg. Is it too late to get a cost seg done? Can a cost seg be done on a primary residence that is used as a rental? So, oh, this is a really great question. It actually was one of my points tonight. Um, so a cost seg can get done as late as when the tax filing would be due. So uh, um, we have a 2023 property that you bought and you don't have to get the study done in the next three month, uh, three weeks. Um, you have, say you wanna file your tax return on time. You can have it, that's 415 next year. So probably you know a couple of weeks before then or how flexible your CPA is. Um, like us, we probably require it 30 days before, but if you can get the cost seg done by 315, we'll take it and put on your return and file by 415. So, and same thing if you extend, um, if you extend your tax return till 1015, you have all the way until next year to run the cost seg. Um, so that's great there. And okay, great. Um, oh, what is a cost seg? So everyone on the call here, cost segregation, um, simple, crazy word for a uh, uh, expensive report that tells the tax preparer, <laughs> what to separate into different buckets. So by default, your residential real estate, the whole entire thing is considered 27 and a half year property. Or if you have a commercial property, it's 39 year property. However, we all know the doors, the windows, the paint, the cabinets don't last 27 and a half years. So what happens is that this report goes in and you know moves the 27 and a half year property into different buckets. So five year, seven year, 15 year buckets. And then that way, now you have a smaller um, denominator and then that way you're just be able to take more depreciation. Um, so you're accelerating your depreciation um, because you have a smaller useful life of that property. So now you can write off more and then the, um, bonus depreciation on top of accelerated is that you can take 80% of bonus depreciation in 2023. So if you have five-year property that's worth 10,000 bucks, you'll be able to take $8,000 this year and then depreciate the remaining $2,000 over the next four years. Um, so that's what the cost seg report is. And then after the five or seven years doesn't mean I have no more depreciation. That's correct. So once you, you exhausted the whole five-year property, then you have no more left. Um, same thing for the seven year um, property. Once after seven years, it's more or less gone. But another thing too, is that once you do bonus depreciation, I mean, pretty much the whole thing is gone. <laughs> so you just have to keep on rinse and repeating, right? So you're gonna take a great big benefit this year. And then next year, I mean, you're gonna reduce the amount of taxes and then take that money to go buy another property. So the cycle keeps on continuing. So it's a you know, Rob, Peter, pay Paul type of thing um, until the, the joke is until you die and then all the properties step up to your heirs. Um, so that's the uh, grim joke for the night. And, and Tony, um, is that, you can only do that on a property you buy like right away or is it the property you have already? Uh, both. Yeah, both. Yeah, we generally both. recommend that you um, do the cost seg in the year that you buy the property. Um, just because bonus depreciation only applies to the year that you place the asset in service. Um, but it's never too late. You know, it's better late than, or it's better now than later, is that if you had property, say, from 2019, and you just learned about cost segregation, if the tax benefit is enough to outwash the study's fees, because they're going to cost, you know, on the low side, we have vendor that's like six, seven hundred bucks. On the, and then, you know, other vendors are, you know, two, three, four K in that range. 
So you got to make sure your tax savings are going to be there. The economics are there. Um, so you can run it and then you'll have a change of accounting method that year. And it will just, um, you, you front load a lot that year again. So another way to do it too, but less of a benefit. So you want to always weigh out the cost benefit on that side. Good question though. Um, let's see here. Oh, and then on the, you can cost seg a primary residence that's used as a rental. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question there, Victor. So yep, you can. And then just, um, I know people are always concerned about um, depreciation recapture. However, you know, on, on a primary, you actually have some um, leeway. So say you bought a million dollar property, it cost segged it, and you did 100K of depreciation. So now your cost basis is a million minus 100K because you took the benefit. So you're down to $900,000 as your tax cost basis. And then you say you sell the property for 1.1 uh, and you're single, your gain would be 1.1 minus 0.9, so 200K. And then, however, if you lived there for two years um, and owned it for two years, you get the 121 primary home exclusion. So then that's 250K if you're single. So then in my hypothetical here, you pay zero income taxes and there is no recapture. Um, because you have that exclusion. So that's where, you know, it's a good way to hack it. Um, so that's another good area for you there. But um, generally speaking, if you have a rental property and you do, and it's not your primary, you will have to pay depreciation recapture unless you, you know, 1031 exchange it or you opportunity zone it or you buy another property that year and then run a cost seg on it and it'll like offset it. So I wouldn't let the um, depreciation recapture scare you from not selling and doing more deals. Like um, one big thing is that um, taxes, like never let the tax tail wag the dog, right? The dog's the main show here. Like the investments, the economics is what you're after. Tax is just a cherry on top of like, and just how big and that sweet can you make that cherry is all the tax planning. So, but still the deals still have to work out by itself. Um, great. Okay, cool. Let's see here. I'll keep on reading some more things. All right. Bye. Bye. Buy more property. Yeah. I'll Just help you with the questions, Tony. So oh, yeah. Victor and I actually, we have similar questions is figuring out what's a good rule of thumb on whether it's worth doing a cost tag or not. Um, for example, he gave an example of like, if say we live in an expensive area and the building is not worth much. Whereas my question is kind of like, Hey, I live in, I live in San Francisco. If I buy like a million dollar property and it only rents for a thousand a month, there's no cash flow. It's negative. Would that even be worth me doing it? Um, it's a, it depends answer. Uh, so it's a few factors you want to consider <laughs> is um, so if you're, man, it is a big, it depends. Let me just lay them all out there. Uh, so if your real estate professional status Yes, it will always help you because it's active losses offsetting active income, assuming you have enough active income. Um, if you are, say, a short-term rental person, you're doing a loophole, then yes, again, because that's active loss against active income. Um, if you're over 150K adjusted gross income, it probably won't help you if you have no other passive positive income to offset. Um, so let's flip the script, what I mean on that. So say if you have, you run a cost seg on your rental property, but then you're like a silent investor, um, say into like, you know, um, Annie's burrito truck and she cuts you fat dividends every year. So you, now you have passive positive income and that's going to offset the passive losses. So they're going to net. So that will help. Um, and then the other scenario is if you make less than 150K AGI, then you can take the mom and pop deduction. Um, and you get $25,000 up to the first 100K of your income. And then it phases out half per um, half per thousand bucks. So it's completely gone 150K. Um, you get 12,500 if you're making 125K. So scale it per your income. So... Yeah, it's always a it depends question. But then the other thing is too, is that if you forecast yourself in the next year to say have a lot of positive passive income, 
than running a cost sag and having this big piggy bank of losses. You can break the piggy bank and then offset it. So yeah, it probably, yeah, it depends. Talk to your tax advisor, draw it out on the sheet um, type of question. But yeah, there's not a great, great answer. Yeah, there's like four or five different scenarios like that already. But I think if you get my general gist of like, I think the bi biggest thing for everyone on the call is that one, be aware cost I guess is a great strategy. Two, probably just ask your tax advisor <laughs> um, about it. It's more so your job to like, not your job, but it's great for you to be educated to know that this is a thing to raise to your tax advisor and be aware of it, I would say is the biggest thing. You don't have to know when to deploy it, but just probably just be like, you know, talk to your buddy or talk to your advisor and be like, oh, hey, do you actually do a cost seg and maybe get some facts and then they have it. The main issue that I see with tax planning is that you didn't even know it existed. <laughs> uh, that's that's the biggest disconnect because you don't know what you don't know. But at least now everyone on this call knows that cost seg is a great tool. And then raise your hand and if you're confused, if you don't know if you should do it or not. Yay, Brianna, raise your hand. <laughs> I just had a question. Um, so just a little bit confused. I bought a property in 2023 um, and I was going to see if I could try for the bonus appreciation. Did you say if I was trying for that, that I had to have the cost seg done this year? Oh, no. Or that can still wait? Oh, it, it can wait. Yeah, yeah. You oh, can okay. wait. just get it done before you file your taxes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just want to yep. make sure. Can I yep. ask another question too? Um, do I have to use, so I have a renter set up for the end of the year, but does it have to be through Airbnb or? No, that's fine. Um, so you can have it through, um, you have a direct list too. So if, as long as you have like an invoice um, sure. for the person. So, you know, stating the um, days they stayed, probably the person's um, receipt information, and then just having that documentation ready for it is uh, is great. And then like, obviously the amounts and all that fun stuff. So as long as there's some paper trail on it, um, that, that would be good on that side. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, nice. Congrats. Yeah. Are you closed in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I closed in like, I think like eight more days or so. So, but everything oh, looks dang. smooth. Just in time. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Just, I know. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Great. Cool. All right. There's a couple more questions in here about the cost eggs. So okay. Brian asked, so are you saying that if you, if you were a high wage W2 earner, um, it, it wouldn't be so useful for So I'm going to give a hypothetical situation. Pretend I make $125,000 W2 and I only have one single family home in San Francisco where it's negative cash flowing, you know, the break even kind of thing. And would you say that in that situation, it would even be worth doing a cost like in that situation? Um, if I don't you have already, other passive income, I don't have other passive income. I don't, I only have that one, um, investment property and I ha I make about 125,000 a year. So I'm still within the 150 zone, yep. but I only have that one single family home. Oh yeah. It would be, um, if you have $12,500 of tax loss. So when I mean tax loss is like after depreciation, then you don't need a cost seg because you're not going to get back your 700 bucks um, to run the study. Um, but if you don't have $12,500 of loss, um, then run it. Yeah. So depends on if you already have a loss <clears throat> that high already, then don't run it. You're not going to get your money back. Um, but yeah. So in this scenario, I guess in this scenario, if we just use it as a, as, as a use case, do you have twelve thousand five hundred dollars of a loss if you're just break even cash flow? Yeah, so you don't have a loss yet, a uh, tax loss. Not much. It'd probably been worth it. Oh yeah, uh huh. Yeah, so if you don't have a tax loss, California yeah. home, it would be negative cash flow. You're oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So then, yeah, I mean, if you have negative cash flow on paper, you for sure have a tax loss on uh, on uh, uh, for sure. Because <laughs> generally uh -huh. speaking, um, this is how I creep on everyone's tax return. By the way. Um, <laughs> I'm a creep. So, um, I'll look at the schedule E and if it shows positive, generally I'll be like, wait a second, this makes no sense. So then I'll check in with the client and then be like, are we missing deductions? I'll review if their deductions are right. And then if they're still right, then I'm like, what do you do? Like, <laughs> like, why is it renting out so high? Why is it so profitable? That's how I know, like, 
that property is hot or that's a great investment. Because generally speaking, if you have a mortgage on a property, it should always be in a loss position. So that's another way how you guys can quickly check your work um, when you TurboTax it or if your CPA does it. If your Schedule E shows positive still and you have a mortgage, it may or may not, it may be wrong unless it's like a highly profitable thing like uh, MTRs, STRs. Like I expect those to be positive. Um, but you know, if it's LTR, I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. The so next question is from Victor. So if you run a cost seg, can you choose to apply a certain amount across multiple years? For example, if he does a cost seg report and it says that he has 200 K worth of depreciation, can he apply 50,000 per year? So it's only applied to the highest margin rate rather than say I'm using it all in, in the beginning where um, it's, it's, it will go through multiple uh, brackets for margins for uh, rate for tax market uh, margin rates. Oh yeah. So you would have to, it would only apply per year. So you either choose um, bonus or you elect out and you go straight line. So for example, we have a five-year property and it's 10,000 bucks. Um, you either choose to take $8,000 this year or you take 10 divided by five. So it'll take $2,000 each year. So you either choose one or the other, but you can't pick and choose and be like, all right, let me take 7.5 this year and then 2.5 next year. Um, you have to stay to bonus or straight line of the useful life. All right, so Becca says, I had $25,000 of losses when I put a property into service in 2022 from the renovations, then renting it out in September, 2022. Currently it's negative cash flow. It's in the Bay, it's a single family home. So she wants to know, does that mean it wouldn't benefit her to do a cost seg? Oh, hey, Becca. Uh, uh, nice to Hi. see you. Yeah. All right. So 25,000 loss when I put property in service. And then, oh yeah, no, it would not, um, it would not benefit you um, because you're in a loss position already, unless it's active income or you have, unless that property is active, then uh, you can take active losses against your um, active income. Um, oh, so I'd I would have to have reps status. Yep, rep status um, on that side. Yep, so rep status, STR, loophole okay. status. Um, correct. Oh, or the mom and pop deduction, the under 150K AGI that we've been talking about. Okay. Um, with the rep status, um, I would have to go back and backtrack and add up all my time and then do an amendment to the 2022 taxes. Uh huh. Yeah, correct. Yeah, you would have to amend it and then claim the claim the refund for it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, um, oh, I guess another thing. Speaking of amendments, I don't know. I found a flurry of folks lately, um, where they had um STRs, and then like the other CPAs just like messed it up completely. So they one uh, didn't do the bonus depreciation. Um, two they put on a Schedule C. Um, so then, yeah, we <laughs> were like claiming like 20, 30 K refunds right now, just cause going back and amending and doing it the right way. So yeah, there's just another call out there. <laughs> um, so generally speaking, if you have an STR, um, it should go on schedule E unless you're providing substantial services, AKA like you're going there and like cooking breakfast for them and taking them on a bike ride tour. So like it generally should not go on schedule C. And then continuing with cost side questions would be, um, say I just bought a property and it's kind of a fixer. Would you recommend that I could do a cost egg as soon as I buy it or wait until I rehab it and then do a cost egg? Um, If the rehab's going to finish before your next tax filing time, then wait. Um, if the rehab's long um, and the unit is placed in service, then um, do a cost seg now and then later on do an improvement study. So that's how you can still take benefit of that side. So uh, that would be your uh, game game plan there. And then how do you do this, um, that amendment, the, the second part that you said? Was it, oh, was improvement it, study? Have, yeah, and do I have to pay for like a whole second report again? Yeah, so generally it's like a little bit less, um, but yeah, you do want to contact um, whoever does your cost seg and then they can just add this extra study on 
and then just go to you and then you can uh, put onto your CPA um, or tax preparer to um, throw that onto your next depreciation schedule too. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, I think before anyone runs into any issues, I think, I think from the grapevine I saw last year was, uh, man, TurboTax Online does not do bonus depreciation, I think. Oh yeah, and, you were helping someone out and it didn't work, right? Oh yeah, some from Sarah. I was like, oh yeah. shit, man. I'll, I'll like, you gotta make some manual adjustments. Um, the QuickBooks desktop, not QuickBooks, TurboTax desktop does, I think. I don't know. I'm just saying that so you guys can plan before you go in. I'm gonna do my tax return on like 414, and you're like, oh man, it doesn't work, and then uh, you're SOL. Bro, if you can afford real estate, you can afford a CPA rather than just terrible taxing it. Like for real, dude. <laughs> it's the uh, inside <laughs> jokes. Uh huh. Yeah. And then like, speaking of cost eggs, because you you've seen you work with so many SARE members and real estate investors, how much does something like that cost? Um, so, um, Danny and I went on a, on a hunt <laughs> lately and we found a new, um, a new partner and like, they're like six twenty five, seven twenty five. If the property is less than seven fifty K reports aren't pretty, but it does the job. Like it ex extracts it into like five, seven fifteen year property. Um, so that's on the low end. Um, however, you know, other vendors, um, there's another lady, she's like 2K um, that we found. And then- um, Are these single family homes or the small multis that you- Single family you? homes, yeah. It's usually based off like the uh, price of the property. So all that, but I think like market rate though is like two and a half though, I'd say generally speaking for a single family home. Obviously, if you have a big, like, like a big multifamily, you're probably looking three, four. Um, so that's like your general ballpark. There's some like, bigger company i think like um hey, my man. guy was cheaper boomer remember he was oh man yeah he boosted his rate <laughs> oh did he yeah yeah. i should lock in our discount he was like i get i have so many done with him in referrals man. yeah i went up to 2.6 i'm like <laughs> damn i'm like all right i mean his, his stuff's great though um it's great quality work um he's fast and then um the 3115 um change of counting method they do also so it's a um, pretty top tier service, not gonna lie. So yeah, we still we still use them all. I'm like, hey, here's here's a list. Pick your poison. Um, I'm not. Yeah, I'm like, I don't mind either way. And then also picking out on vendors because like there's always conversations about their um, desktop ones where they're just all electronic ones. And then the, like my guy Boomer, he they actually have someone sent out. It's an engineering structural firm. And then there's also like CPA companies that does it too. Not all CPAs, but like some of the bigger ones. How do we choose between these options and these different price points and picking something where I'm not going to be likely audited by IRS because someone fucked up? Oh yeah. Um, I'd say it's like kind of up to you on what type of insurance you want to buy. Um, so like, I know some of them do have like audit protection. So do you want to buy that or not? Um, but generally speaking, um, like if you have, if you have the report and you ever get audited and then you furnish the report, you should be fine. Um, so, you know, I'd say, well, inner Asian of me, I'm just like, ah, screw it. Just, <laughs> just use it low and, uh, you know, low and cost effective. Um, like all mine, I'm going to run through that, uh, the, you know, the six twenty five seven hundred dollars vendor. Um, cause I don't really care. Cause it's like, all right. Cause generally when you get an audit, it's more like they just want support. Like an audit's not bad. They're just doing their job. Um, so it's like, all right, cool. Here's my report. And then there should be a no adjustment change anyways. Um, but if you want to just kind of lock in that assurance, you know, like, Hey, you know, if I do get audited, will you cover me? And then usually it's like a, uh, it's a hot potato game, I would say probably between the cost tech firm and the CPA. So, you know, it's kind of up to you on your preference on that side. Like me personally speaking, I'm just going to use the cheap one just to maintain my margins on the, <laughs> on the property. And then are they the same across the board in what the report and other findings? Or do you say that there's certain firms that are like, I'm going to be a lot more aggressive and say like, take more deductions and maybe potentially that could lead to more risk for audits. Um, so yeah, there's, um, a few different styles in terms of the firms and their take, um, cause they all have used different softwares, right? Like how do they strip out 27 half year property into 
five, seven, 15 year property. Um, so it's kind of really up to them. Um, what we ran them across the board and more or less, they're generally the same. Some firms are a hair bit more aggressive, some are not, um, but it does boil down to the incremental cost time. So like, say you had to pay an extra two grand, is that 2K going to outwash your savings? That's where the economics kind of come back into play. So that's another thing of how you're choosing vendors. But yeah, it's crazy just um, like everything that's out there now. There's um, there's one dude I met. Um, he's a pretty cool cat. Um, Ro built, Rob built. Um, he came out with his own like cost tag. He's a big STR guy. Um, so I talked to him. He came out with a cool software. Um, so there's a lot of options out there. But at, at the end of the day, you know, as long as the reports, because you, you get quotes on all these, man, speaking of so much, I should like start off my own service, but, um, you know, you can get all the, all of them provide quotes. So if you can see a prelim, um, depreciation and you're happy with it compared to your other ones and it's a cheaper cost, just, just use that one. And then Victor wants to know if you recommend any firms that are more aggressive with their cost eggs and he's fine with it, even if it costs a little more. I would say, yeah, there's, um, my boomer's great. Um, you can use him, um, see what he comes out with. Um, I think, I think, yeah, him, um, the other man, CSCI was the other firm, I think, Angela that we use, um, who else is there? UST AGI. That's who our preferred vendor is. Um, if you want to like go and have fun, <laughs> like probably go see what Madison specs chart is. Um, they, they always charge way more. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, like everyone yeah. doesn't. They're they're just really like the social media influencers of like Cossacks. Like they're very well known for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want to go dance there just to see, um, so yeah, I'm I'm just curious. I I just don't have the time to go shop, nor do I care because I know the results are ninety ten. So it's more or less the same. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Next question is from Anne. So about is regarding amendments. So if she STR'd in 2019, 2020, but then she stopped STRing it, is she still okay to amend past returns without affecting her current returns? Um, if you amend that one, oh yeah, if you amend that one, you have to amend the other ones. Um, you might be a better off. Yeah. Shoot, yeah. Oh, wait, 2019, 2020. I think the statute of limitations passed. I think it's like three years from the filing date or when the tax was due. Um, it's one of those, uh, calculator Google questions. I always have to remember it was tested on the CPA like test, but I never remember. It's like, it's one or the, it's a ladder of like three years when the tax return was due or when the tax was paid, something like that. Um, so I think 2020 is technically passed. So I think the last year you can amend for, cause we're so late in 23, um, you would have to amend your 21 return, but then you have to go back and fix your 22. So yeah, may be a lost cause, but you can still uh, run a cost sag, do a change of accounting method and take more depreciation if you want. But wait a second. Oh, if it's a non-STR, it may not be worth it. Okay, never mind. I'm just going in circles. Um, yeah, continuing on. Cool. And then another question is from Victor again. In, in your experience, how often is um, the rep status audited? if your spouse does not have a W-2 and they try to recreate an activity log? Um, well, we've, it's been easy the last few years. been like no audits. Um, so <laughs> um, it's because the IRS is understaffed, um, but they got money now, so they have staffing. Um, so <laughs> I think now was like the time to get your ducks in a row. Um, but did, did you steal your cousin from the IRS? <laughs> to yeah, work? yeah. Inside man now. Yeah. Inside man. Ironically, he dude, he, he was telling me like no IRS agents like trained in this crap. I'm like, really? Um, so like the um the STR stuff, for example, like the accelerated depreciation, like the only thing that they, they're gonna know is like, oh wait, why is it so much and why is that offsetting active income? So his own take is that like there's not even an audit technique. Or it's just going to be like, oh, hey, this is too much. It's flagged by the computer. Can you provide the substantiation? So it may be a good upside, but it's really new. Like the whole STR stuff and the IRS is so behind. Um, but the funding might be taken away from the war. So maybe they're going to be under, underfunded again. <laughs> um, I don't know. We'll just stay in tuned here. Then would you think because like kind of running these cost eggs and the STR and these like more advanced strategies that 
normal citizens wouldn't really know how to use. Would you feel that because we're claiming those that we're more likely to get audited just because we're using it and they're, they don't really know much about it or see much of it? Um, higher chance, but still lower chance, depending on your income levels. Um, so, I mean, generally the resources are limited in terms of who they do audit. Um, the audit rates, if you look up, you know, what your income tax bracket are still very, very low, you know, it's about like 0.1% or something. I think it, once you hit over 10 million, I think you're a 1% chance of getting audited. Um, or if you're, um, broke as hell, um, and you show like you claim all the earned income tax credits, um, then you have a higher chance. You're probably back to the 1% of audits um, versus dropping into like the point ones. Um, so it's kind of like spectrums. So re lower chance, but still subject to it. Um, but I wouldn't be overly concerned. Um, I think I'm just used to it because when I used to work at Uber, um, just, just got audited all the time. So, and then, I mean, auditors are humans and they just want the papers just to you know, support and do their claim, find the error rate, apply the difference, get some money, close the case. Um, my cousin told me too, um, there's just quotas that you have to meet. So they get assigned quota, close the case. Um, so some coworkers, they're there just for a paycheck. They close cases and go home. Some have ego issues and just um, come after you for every dime. So it, it, it's, I think it's a box of chocks of who you get. Um, so just uh, more insight from the inside man. I mean, one day we should grab your cousin and come out and hang out with us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. You probably love it. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then um, Becca has questions about the activity log. She says that it's um, of claiming the rep status and all that. She said it's really tedious to keep track of like, hey, I spent 15 minutes talking with my realtor or 10 minutes emailing a lender. So do you actually have to um, put the start and end times? Because otherwise it's going to take forever to do. Like how how detailed do you expect us to be? Um, I wouldn't say you need to start and end times, but you probably do want a realistic amount of uh, timing. Um, so, you know, I generally say like, well, this stems from the public accounting world where you charge everything to the point one. So you, you bill every six minutes. Um, I'm sure Davis knows too. <laughs> if anyone's received a bill from him. Um, actually, I don't know how he bills. He just tells me how much I owe him. I'm like, okay. Um, so, you know, it, I would say, you know, don't have two round, like don't have like 0.5 hours. You know, if you have like, you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, you know, hours to do this, or, you know, for example, um, 10 minutes, but like 0.2, uh, 15 minutes, but 0.3, because that's like, you know, every six minutes. Um, but you don't need to start and end time. But I would say um, what you did was the activity, the date, um, how much time you spent doing it. So who did you talk to? What were you doing? When? Where? Maybe if you want to put the where and why. I guess if you answer the who, what, when, where, why. Um, or or get um, reps tracker. Um, Danny uses it. So um, yeah, you can uh, use that tool too. Uh, Clockify is free. Um, spreadsheet's great. Um, pick something. Um, you can also use your calendar um, as, as another support. So if you just log everything in your calendar, like... Hey, I had a meeting with this, meeting with that. Um, so, because Google Calendar, actually, I don't know how far Google Calendar goes back. Um, if it goes back forever, seven years, then use it. If it doesn't go back more than seven years, don't use it. Um, oh, wait, bro, you stopped using Reps Tracker? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Well, all right, maybe not anymore. Uh, Danny always has the best. Oh, Notion. Oh, okay, nice. Oh, it's free. <laughs> no, 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 no. Thanks, Danny. Danny, bro, like Notion is only free until a certain point. Then after you have too many boxes, they start charging you and that comes up pretty quickly. Uh, so watch out okay. for that. You don't want to lose shit. Yeah. Oh, no, then I just roll with what Danny goes with normally because <laughs> dude's super optimized. So I just anyone needs anything, just follow his lead uh, generally. It, it, it's free up to the, up to the first thousand um, boxes or whatever you create, like the first thousand uh, items. Oh, first little database tables, I'm assuming. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I see. I see. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So yeah, just track the hour somewhere and have it ready somewhere if it ever happens. Yeah. Uh, the burden of proof is always on the taxpayer. So you need to come up with something. And then depending on the hours I'm using, can hanging out with Sarah, Sarah field trips, does that count for hours or can I write that off somehow? So I can have an excuse to hang out with Annie and Nelson more. Um, the, the hours would be hard. Um, but, um, I think you could probably get away with, um, the, the trips in itself. Right. So I generally say, if you're going to 
go visit Dallas and you end up buying a property, you know, that's where you can find the, you know, go to your schedule E, find that property, line it up with the travel box and, you know, shove it in there. Um, so you can probably get, you know, in there or, you know, continue education. Um, so, <laughs> you know, you kind of put it in there. Um, so it's, you know, your risk appetite and, you know, there's smaller things. Um, I don't know if I've had that many schedule E's audited or I even heard about it. Schedule C's get played. E's don't um, as much. So what's the difference between the C and the E? Oh, so the E is for rental properties. Um, and then the C's are for sole proprietors. Um, so sole proprietors. Um, oh yeah, that's that's the other flag that I hate about other like tax pros when they put the STR on a schedule C um, because that's like a red flag for the IRS. I was like, yo, why is there a loss? And can you substantiate the loss versus an E doesn't. Um, so just another heads up. Um, yeah, but C's are generally reserved for sole proprietorships. All I got out of that is that he, you guys can come hang out with Sarah on field trips and at our conferences, and he can write that off for you. There you go. <laughs> there you go. A plug for uh, Sarah. Continue 24. education. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. Perfect. All right. Great. Um, all right. So questions. And then let's see here. Um, and well, actually you're going back into that, um, that's the schedule C with the STR. How come like it's, it's supposed to be on that side rather than it's a rental property. And then how do you get into negatives with that STR? Uh, the STR has to, um, so why it doesn't go on a C is because unless you provided substantial services, which is like actually working in the business, um, then there's not really a reason to show it on there. Um, also another thing that happens in year two though, is that it goes on schedule C again, it'll be positive and you'll be subject to self-employment taxes, but that takes to the whole point of real estate investing out, right? Like one of the key benefits of real estate investing is it's not considered active income generally, right? So then you're not subject to self-employment taxes. Um, so just a lot of reasons not to put on C it's only subject to ordinary income taxes when it's on the E. Um, so reasons why uh, you want to put on the E instead, and then also from a lender perspective, um, they will be able to back out depreciation against um, the net income. So it may actually show positive and then it'll help you if you're trying to qualify for loans. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty much like a no-no on a C essentially. Um, but there is the one rare exceptional case where Generally speaking, say if someone's just, you know, a retired person and they love shooting the shit with their, your guests and actually like, you know, treat them like, like a true bed and breakfast, then it can belong on a C. So in Danny's situation, he's managing all the cleaners and all that same with Tracy and say they also, they're, they're running their cost tag. So for them, if they're actively managing it, it's still not considered as active income. Um, it's considered, it's considered active on the schedule E side, but it's not considered for C purposes. Um, C is like truly running like day in and day out type of business, right? There's not a, uh, material participation part, um, on C, right? Once you say C it's just automatically active. Um, I think the biggest reason why I see other practitioners put it on the C is because they don't know how to put it on the e and trigger it because there's like a well in our tax software there's like a little box you have to tick um but you have to kind of play around with it to make sure it happens oh shit actually if you self-prepare i don't know how it works on turbo tax yeah just review the forms i don't know sometimes people ask me like how to do things like i actually don't know how to use the software that well i know how to do the forms really well um so if your box doesn't show a loss um on it then that's when you know it's not correct I, I'm going to keep reminding people is that if you can afford to buy a house and do short-term rental, you can afford an accountant or a CPA or someone to do this. Yeah, to do it. Yeah, I, I would just say at this point, yeah, just don't do it yourself. Like, I feel like they're you know. going to get so much in trouble and they're not, they're, they're saving money on paying that person, but they're probably not doing things properly and they don't know all the, like the areas where they can save money on. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then also for kind of the people who are listening in, I hope that you're starting to hear some of the themes. This this part, it took, it took me really about th two, three years to really learn and educate myself is understanding the different buckets of income and understanding what's considered passive and what's considered active because the uh, of active income and how certain actions can pull certain triggers to 
to to make huge changes. And so for me, um, in the past, I was using like the big companies, like those uh, Jackson Hewitt, those HR blocks, those people who just file the taxes, but at, they they can only do and file based on the things I've already done. But no one was educating me on like thinking in advance, uh, planning for next year on how these um, things can make changes on what I do. So that's kind of like the purpose of why I wanted to bring Tony in to ex explain that part to you guys of all these little triggers and buttons and that you guys can press and what would happen. So appreciate Tony for that. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Cool, cool. All right, next question is from Becca. The rental income um, on her 1099 that she received from her property management company for a multifamily, which is co-owned by her family, it doesn't match up with her total income and expenses on the 12th month income and expenses report. So what should she, what should she do? Um, so tax wise, you always want to report what's on the 1099. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. And, and then make the adjustment. Okay. Uh, if it doesn't match up. Okay. So, um, that's how you get audited, um, is oh. 1099 misks don't equal, don't equal your schedule E total income. So say if your misc said 10 K uh -huh. and then your, um, schedule E said 9,800, cause you're just missing a little bit. Yeah. Um, so you like self-counted, then um, you'll probably get a notice. <laughs> um, so always tie it back to what the 1099 MISC or 1099 NEC says. Um, those are your key parts. So always report because uh, the IRS system is actually checks and balances. Okay. So the 1099 MISC goes to you, but also goes to the IRS. So they're okay. waiting for you to give them the like when up here, you have to match it here. So otherwise, that's how they know. So back okay. to TDLR is you go email your property manager and tell uh -oh. them they fucked up and <laughs> correct it. And they give you the new um, 12 month cash flow report. Then they can go to track 1099.com, which is whatever they probably use to issue their 1099s and just go fix it. It takes them like three minutes max. Don't just, you know, take whatever they say and go with it. Just double check and then let them fix it for you. Okay. Oh, okay. So that happened with 2021 and 2022. The TurboTax CPA told me to use the amount on the cash flow sheet and multiply my percentage. So I guess, I don't know. Hopefully I don't get audited. I mean, oh, it's off yeah. by like $2,000. It's not like a huge amount. Oh, yeah. I would just I would just wait for the notice to come back. Like sometimes oh, like, okay. if you forget stuff, just okay. wait for the IRS to adjust it. Um okay. Generally speaking, well, the IRS is slower. The FTB will find you first. <laughs> um, oh, okay. in California, FTB yeah. is FTB is a godly organization. <laughs> They're so fast. Um, it's shocking. Yeah. Okay. So I need to tell the property management company to adjust um, something. Uh, correct the numbers. They have to correct their 12, the 12 month report stuff. And then recalculate your portion, and then they can edit the, your their ten ninety nine. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. It's really easy because I it's, that happened to me with Tony, and I, I got it fixed really quickly. <laughs> and Tony does a really good job of pointing out these like discrepancies. <laughs> cool. All right, Victor asks, can you discuss from a tax perspective if there are advantages of having multiple LLC? trust and entities, or is it more of a legal protection? Um, he imagines that it's more costly and complicated to file all of those returns. Um, let's see here. So if they're LLCs, <laughs> generally speaking, no, because um, LLCs are passed through entities. Um, so all the income passes back to you anyways. Um, revocable living trusts are also passed through back to you. Um, so those don't matter. However, once you get into the entities that don't pass back to you, that's when they you can get some pretty um, cool structuring in. Um, so for example, if you have a C corporation, that's a standalone entity and it pays a flat rate of 21% Fed tax. Um, so that could be where it ends with you, generally used for family office management companies, um, used for PM companies, um, if you're self-managing everything. So there's a strategy there. Um, and then we don't do any of this work, but just from a theory standpoint is if you have a irrevocable living trust, that is also a standalone entity and it pays its own taxes. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, unless you have a very 
high portfolio, you probably won't use a C Corp. Um, and then I don't generally see a lot of like, the only time an irrevocable living trust would make sense to me is if you wanted to donate that property to get a fat charitable contribution and keep it in that uh, trust and lock it in. Um, but yeah, definitely a uh, attorney CPA type of thing to ask. Um, but yeah, that's what I'd say, well, generally speaking, because, you know, at a maintenance cost, I mean, you're probably looking at four or five grand just to maintain a C Corp because um, you have tax filing, then you have uh, payroll, and then you have uh, bookkeeping. Um, and I haven't even talked about like strategy. <laughs> so um, those things, you know, you need to have enough taxes to save to even outwash the headache um, entering into those strategies. When we talk about like um, company setup, so if like I'm looking to purchase a home out, out of state, out of California, I'm going to be traveling to all these states um next year but i don't buy anything like is, is is it best to i'm trying to figure out how to get some like tax write off off my w2 and um yeah mm, does it, does it not work or do you have to kind of purchase something in the state to actually consider like an actual legit type expense yeah <laughs> you probably want to purchase because the, the reason why you need to purchase something is that um you need anywhere on the tax return, you need a box to uh, write off the travel. <laughs> um, so there's no mechanism um, besides on the Schedule E um, or Schedule C. Um, the other thing too, if you're just kind of like looking write-offs for your um, W-2 side too, is you know whatever your W-2 side job is, um, take that and just find some side hustle income with it so you can start writing things off. Um, so that's another thing that you can think about. A lot, a lot of my software engineer um, folks, um, they, a lot of their base W-2 and then they'll go pick up a contract income and then, then we can unlock some deductions for them that way too. So same proxy. So the, the you need some vehicle, whether it's the Schedule E or C to take these type of write-offs. Thanks. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, join the join the STR gang, man. Yeah, definitely. For, if you're W-2, yeah, you're W-2. Tony, can I just ask... Um... I was trying to figure out a list of things. I think for the short term rental, I have to have a hundred hours yep. mm -hmm. put in. Um, so if I was gonna do travel or whatnot, like if I did plan on driving to my short term rental, it's like eighteen hours away. Would how would I document that if I wanted to add that for hours? Um, so the drive wouldn't work. The only drive that works is like the in between. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. The in between. So how they say is that you're. I mean, you could hack it. It's, it's more aggressive, but generally okay. speaking, from point um, starting home, so home to business, that Porsche, that leg is not a write-off. Um, business to home is not a write-off, but say you take business to Home Depot, business to Lowe's, those are Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. There is the um, Tom Wheelwright strategy. <laughs> uh, if, if anyone doesn't know who he is, he's like Robert Kiyosaki CPA. Uh, <laughs> he goes with the... Your home office is your first stop. So downstairs is your first stop. And then everything outside of that is business. And then you come home and that's your second stop is. So that's the, that's the Tom Wheelwright of doing it. I mean, okay. it, it's aggressive, but I guess like technically he has a point um, that mm -hmm. is, oh, damn. And he's got it. Nice. And he's got it. Oh, that's hilarious. Nice. So it wouldn't, so travel doesn't actually count for, I thought travel counted, but no. Travel, if you do, if you do the aggressive way, it, it, it could. Okay. <laughs> all right. Way. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, and he's got all the books. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you had paper copies of the, uh, of the, um, the well, textbook books. Yeah. That's cause I got an autograph. Oh, yeah. Your autograph. Heart. Nice. Nice. Uh huh. That's nice, their con. Nice. So I don't know if you guys are bigger pockets fans, um, but Amanda Han was actually one of our speakers this year. And so I was like, hey, and, and her husband, they were the authors of these books. And I was like, I want a nada grow. <laughs> nice, nice. I just uh <laughs> I showed up to uh the Zen Coast event like a couple of weeks ago, and then uh Jenny was like, Hey, read these. I'm like, all right, sounds good. <laughs> I got those <laughs> books for free now, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't give you the books too. Yeah, I you got I got that too. I was I just like, that. all right. 
Yeah, unless anything changed. What, has there been a second edition or no? Uh, the the there's a volume one and two. I would say the volume one is is too basic for for the people in our group already. But yeah. I would say definitely um, read volume two, um, yeah. just the advanced copy. But um, I would actually prefer like reading this one first for Amanda Han. But then I really really like this one, the Tax Free Wealth by. Tom oh, Hall. you like that one? I've I've read it like twice probably because oh, this really? one is a little bit more in detail. I would say. Um, and I like the Amanda Hobbs because she has sample stories of um, yeah. real life clients so that it felt like it was easier to apply. But like this one was like more detailed about the rules. Oh, got it. Yeah, I, I read it just to read it. And then um, I was just like, damn, like it was very like theory related. I, I The only thing I didn't like about it was it wasn't very actionable because I'm like, well, it's easy for me because I know how to do it. But I mean, like any commoner, I'm like, oh, shit. I don't well, know. That's actually why I needed do both. I needed yeah. both. Because oh, nice. it's the one that's actionable and telling you how to um, like, you know, take the weekends off and still kind of write it off type of thing. Whereas this oh, one nice. is more the theories. Oh, there you go. There you go. There's, like, more, there's more examples and more theories. Yeah, that's uh, that's everyone's Christmas uh, Christmas uh, plan to do now. Yeah, pick up those oh, books. Yeah. Well, you put the titles in, in, oh, I can do it. So, in chat. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm thinking like, shit, I should have gotten like an Amazon affiliate code for Sarah or something. Yeah, straight up. You should <laughs> hold off on sending it until you get the affiliate code. Oh, oh man. And then also like, um, this is, we do, we did this a couple of years ago when we first started Sarah was that um, we had like a giant group of people because we were during the pandemic and all of us would spend a month or so and read all of these books together. And then every week we would get together and talk about it. So if you guys ever wanted to start something like that, let me know. I personally do know the authors and they are willing to come and say hi and, you know, talk to you guys if you really wanted to. Just yeah. saying. We got connections now, <laughs> but go on, Tony. There we go. Okay. Um, so those, yeah, those are great questions there. Da, 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 da. And then, all right, what else did I not talk about? Um, oh, estimated taxes. Um, so the other thing is estimated taxes are going to be due January 15th. Um, so just pay in anything. If you do owe, um, you know, pay in a little bit by 115. Um, if you don't, yeah, don't worry about it. If you have enough withholding. Um, and then let's see here. Oh, if anyone has FSA benefits, um, just from your end side, uh, just use them up. Um, I think you only get to carry over two months worth into the new year. Otherwise it's a use it or lose it benefit. Um, so do that. Um, <laughs> a couple of buddies of mine, um, just sent them receipts to go claim it. It's from his other friends. He didn't actually spend the money. So, um, I guess that's a one way to use your friends, uh, for that, <laughs> Um, and then you guys get the aura ring. It's like on, um, because Sarah, we're, we're doing this thing about wellness. And so like oh, all of us are kind of in this small group where you all get the aura ring kind of like, you know, our cult group wedding ring type of thing. And like for health tracking too. Oh, nice. <laughs> we're, we're going far beyond real estate in Sarah now. There you go. I just, uh, I lost my charger to mine and then I've been playing back and forth. I just like returned the charger again last night. So Got the ring that does not track anything. <laughs> you can buy a replacement one with your FSA. And I still have money on my FSA card if you don't have SA and you want to give me your receipt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I bought it like months ago and I forgot to return it. And then I like begged them, like, can I just swap it, please? Because I bought the wrong size. It's the second time I bought the wrong size. So just no luck. I was like, God, it's just a pretty ring now. But hopefully I get the charger soon. Um, so yeah, FSA, uh, milk and spend that out. And then, um, oh, the last, let's see, let's, one, let's see. Oh yeah. The last thing I'd just say, um, if you're going to do a backdoor Roth IRA, um, has to be done in the current year. So you can contribute to traditional Roth IRAs post 1231. However, if you want to do a backdoor, it has to be done within the current year. So you have 24 days to do that. Um, do note, if you have balances in your traditional or rollover IRA, they do have to be taxed when you send it over to the Roth IRA. Um, so evaluate if that's a strategy you want to do or not. Um, generally speaking, if you think you're going to be in a higher income bracket when you're 59 and a half and or you think tax rates are going to be more progressive, then probably Roth IRA. 
But if you think that you'll be in a lower tax bracket and tax rates will stay the same or go down when you're 59 and a half, then traditional IRA is better. Um, so kind of, you know, crystal ball it. No one's got the right answer. Um, <laughs> but those are your guiding principles that you want to think about for if you want to do that or not. Um, so that's totally fine. HSA, you can still contribute by tax filing time. So that's not very a timely thing. Um, and then charitable contributions. Um, so if you're donating this year, um, you know, make all your donations um, before year end. Um, generally speaking, um, if you don't itemize, it probably won't help you. Um, so if you take the standard deduction, um, it won't help you from tax side, but, you know, from the goodness of your heart, you know, you can donate. Um, if the, Annie's fund is still open, you can donate there. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, if you don't use it all in the current year, though, you actually can stack charitable contributions. So say you donated like a thousand this year and, you know, 2000 next year and you still don't itemize, you can like keep it all and then finally like hoard it and then finally use it in a year where you're going to itemize. So just another way to use charity with the uh, gifting season, Christmas holiday um, part here. And then, yeah. Tony, um, you mentioned uh, Roth IRAs. Mm -hmm. if, if, I, if I have some money in a Roth IRA account, if I want to use it for a down payment, can it be pulled out tax-free? The um, principal can, but the earnings can't. Oh, the principal as of the year before, you mean, or? Uh, principal with what well, what's in it yeah so all your like uh, six thousand sixty five hundred fifty five hundred you know because it keeps on adjusting for inflation uh everything that you contributed um into it you can actually pull out tax-free okay yep mm -hmm. oh the other thing too if you're thinking about getting money out um this was um was it there is what is it the uh man Blanket. Well, obviously there's HELOCs. Uh, it's a pledge asset lines. So it's a HELOC for your stocks. Um, so it's, you can take a loan against your stocks to go invest. Um, so interest rates, you know, about prime plus a couple. So probably like eight, 9%, 10% maybe. Um, so you can keep your stocks and still take money out to go invest into it. And then the other part is um, the 70, 72T election. Um, that's where you liquidate um, your whole entire um, uh retirement accounts um, over the next five years. Um, so you get it penalty free, but you still owe the income tax. So say if you're like, all right, peace, like I'm not doing this corporate stuff anymore. I'm going to become like a full-time real estate investor. I'm going to cash everything out and go buy houses. A good way to get money out without waiting until you're 15 and a half. However, the full amount has to come out within the next five years. Um, so just be wary of that. And, but I think most of us, you know, if we're in this call, we, we're we kind of getting that, you know, it's a transition slowly out of the, uh, you know, the part until we have enough, you know, rentals to, you know, live our, you know, free and flexible life. But, you know, another, if anyone quits your job, um, you can roll over your retirement accounts into a self-directed IRA and then uh, invest with your self-directed IRA. Um, so it's a great way to get funds out. Um, I've never been a, massive fan of it um just because the income is tax the gains and the income is tax free however the losses are also like tax free or they don't help you i guess is what i'm trying to say um is that if you have losses in a self-directed ira you don't it doesn't offset your w-2 income so all that depreciation that you're getting from the rentals it's not that great um self-directed iras i'd say are better for um syndications i'd say um, but for just normal holding investing properties, it's not as great because you're losing out on depreciation. But once again, it's a massive, it depends answer. Um, so up to you, talk to your advisor on that. Why would you say it's good for syndications? Because in syndications, they still have a depreciation. Oh, they still have depreciation, but you're going to have that massive gain in okay. you know, year four, five, six. So that massive gain is tax-free. So if you keep on doing them over and over and over again, that whole pot's tax-free. Uh, so you're saying like to use, you're focusing on the equity that you're getting in between like the large part, or if not, then something that um, has dividends or something that usually maybe. Like, yeah. Some type of income people. that's going to keep on generating. Yeah. Or a highly profitable property. So say if you self-direct IRA, you milk out the whole thing, and then you go buy some commercial building that's generating, you pay it cash, right? And it's just generating stacking like 10, 15 K. 
all of it's going to be tax free um, because you won't have mortgage interest to deduct. So more likely than not, that property is going to be positive income on on tax side. So that's another way to think about it. Right. And I think I remember you explained before this is already a tax saving vehicle. So if you're trying to put a tax saving vehicle within another one, it doesn't mean that it's actually a better thing for them or that they yeah. works out well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but it's a uh, it's a great way to get money out, though. Uh, I think the biggest hurdle, and you know, is like where do you find where do you find money to invest in real estate? I think that's always been a challenge. Like, well, shit, <laughs> where do I find this money? Like, I don't know. Like, I know that that was like an early thing when I first started investing. I was like, I don't know, man. Like, until you got Annie, like, you buy anything yet? I'm like, all right, <laughs> I'll find I'll go find some money somehow. <laughs> um, so. You're right. Like it took me a while to get you convinced to really start doing anything real estate. Oh yeah, yeah. It was like <laughs> the crypto side before, and then you're like, all right, like yeah. Then that was all bad. So real estate holds true um, now. Yeah. Actually, we yeah. Oh no, actually, if one funny thing. I don't. Oh, this doesn't apply. Well, actually, it can actually apply to some people in the group. Um, is uh, when Nelson was over, we we're actually chatting about. <laughs> is real estate the right investment? Um, but it's because um, the thing was you should um, invest what's going to bring you the most in terms of like uh, like an appreciation side. So we compared it to, hey, investing in syndications are great because you get a massive appreciation, right? Investing into you know, more beat up or up and coming markets is great because you get appreciation. And it was just between me and him because we're like younger. I'm not that young, but still younger was like, oh, wait, you still have enough time horizon to, you know, do these type of things and wait for the appreciation to come versus trying to buy cash flow immediately today. So, cause I was just like, all right, cool. Let's just go do some pet splits with some friends. And then that's all we did. And then like, it kind of like refocused my mind because I'm like, oh, wait, that's only like, so for example, you pick a deal, it's like 15% cash on cash, great. But if you do a syndication that's going to 4X, <laughs> how long is that going to, that's 400% that we're talking about versus 15% on a property. And then I was like, oh, I'm like, that's a better way to think about it. And then it was just like, wait a second. Then I like did the metrics on my business. I'm like, wait a second should invest more, buy more people. So um, it was just kind of like the mindset. And the big thing was, you know, picking one strategy and then just become a master and craft of that versus shiny object syndrome where you're like, oh, let me try this. Oh, let me try that. And then you have like a diversified portfolio. It's great. But did you pick up and learn that much also? So that was a fun talk that we had um, in terms of like just understanding the bigger picture. Why are you investing? Um, some woo-woo stuff, but it was pretty good though. And it sounds like if I, if I understood it correctly, like you guys are doing the comparison about the, um, the, the understanding of the money has a value, like a time value to it, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you compare, okay. So I think what he's trying to say is that they, because there's so many types of real estate out there, and there's so many like there's people have like they don't know what to pick, what's right for them. But if you realize that money, it it the faster you can get your money back and the faster you can double it, um, it's your your growth is just going to go a lot more exponential. So what he's saying is that if they were able to get double your money within four years versus like with the syndications, you're basically playing on equity versus when he was doing it on pad split, he's going off of the cash flow. He might not be able to double his original money in four years. It might take five or six years, you know, because, you know, it's, it's a different type of... Um, type of investing style and a different product. So as you're exploring the different um, type of real estate to get into, you also have to think about what your exit strategy would be because that would put in play about determining how much equity you're going to build up before you sell. Yeah, yeah. Because it was like, all right, if I drop 80, I'm not going to get my money back for five years, right? But if you dropped 80 in a syndication and at 4X, that's 320, right? So it, it was just like, well, shit, <laughs> like, let's think better about this. Um, it, it was just like, you know, you just you just do what you know, though, right? So that, that was the main issue. It was just like, you didn't know better, but, you know, hence why, you know, got the group, you know, tons of people to talk to. Everyone's super jolly and happy to talk to also. So, you know, I don't think anyone's like very like secretive or anything about what they do. So 
I think that's a great thing is understanding what other people do, how they invest. Like um, I actually met with, met up with one um, guy from the community. Um, we actually went to that hot pot nation spot again. Um, and then he was talking about private money lending. And then he was learn, he was loaning at a minimum of 20%. And I was like, shit. Cause we're like lo loaning to some friends at like 18. It's not that much far off, but he's like, I would never do anything if it's less than 20. I'm like, oh, damn. And then he's like, yes, secure collateral. I'm like, damn, I didn't do that either. Um, so I'm like, you know, a pro versus someone who's just kind of helping a friend out type of style. But it's just great of like, there's, I don't know. I, I think the community's got like all these like secret, like millionaire mastermind people that you don't know who's just lurking in the group. Speaking of the license, but anything above a 10%. Oh, uh, was that Sylvia? You need license anything above 10%. Oh, really? For, for the um, usury laws, right? For like, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, anything above 10% uh, legally, but you, if you get, if you go to court, then uh, you lose without a license. Oh, dang. Okay. Well, good things. These guys are friends. <laughs> Probably stopped lo loaning money to friends now. <laughs> Hard pass. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. Ooh. And what do you mean by the U3 laws have a carve out for brokers exception? Um, hey, sorry, I'm just like furiously typing, but um, no, Sylvia's right. Hey guys, hey Tony. What um, is there's not not legal advice, but um, you know, each state has its own usury laws with caps. In California, there's a general carve out um, for what you would call brokered transactions. So if the hard money loan or the loan was put together by someone with a license, um, you could potentially not not be subject to that usury law. Um, but I would look at that carefully. But I, that, a lot of people use that exception to get there. Okay, okay. Learn it, yeah. Well, like I said, learning something new. Only thing I know is like tax. Like <laughs> I don't know anything else in the world. <laughs> yeah, so that's good. And this is a perfect example of how we have wonderful SAIR people who know a lot of different things because yeah. Anne's actually um, a commercial real estate attorney in the Bay. <laughs> <laughs> so we got the smartest folks in here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great. Yeah. But yeah, those are like the more so year end um, tax tips um, that I had for today's call. Um, so if anyone has more cues, uh, let us know, you know, post it in the uh, chat, our Facebook group. Happy to answer those so people can see at scale or if you're more private, you know, send me a message. I'll get there eventually. Um, and then, um, oh, if anyone wants to be a guinea pig for that um, bookkeeping thing, let me know too. Um, taking out some trial users. And then, yeah, besides that, uh, yeah, thanks for, you know, having us, uh, Annie, here again. Um, any other questions before the night ends? Um, I have a question, quick question. Mm -hmm. How how do you use a virtual assistant for bookkeeping? I I I, I hate bookkeeping, <laughs> and but I hate uh, to reveal my private information like bank account and stuff. Uh, how do you do it without uh reveal too much? Annie, you want to take it or you want or you want me? For me. I don't know if I use it the same way, but I do have um, a VA that helps me with my accounting paperwork and she does not have access to my actual bank accounts. So, um, but she does have access to my wave account. So for me, what I usually do is I have a very specific email that I use for real estate. So um, for example, for the Sarah one, we'll have, we have AP at subtle real estate and that every time that we go out, we go eat, we do something, we have an invoice or a receipt, we'll write down um, on, by hand or something what that specific activity was for, who did I meet, what did we talk about? Well, sometimes I, I too late for who I talked about, but like at least something like that. And then I have her um, upload all of, like I email it all over to that one inbox so that she'll go regularly at least once a month. And then she'll update um, all of my invoices and she checks the categories of what they were. Um, then other VAs, um, they have access to our calendars. So they know exactly who did we meet with, um, who did we talk to? She, they can easily calculate our mileage on, on, um, how, where, wherever we went. And then plus she can see the receipt on, okay, where did we go eat? All right. So put that, plug that in. 
Um, so I find that extremely helpful. And um, the way we hired her was for me personally, we got her through a friend of ours um, in real, he's already in real estate. So she, she knows what to do, but like, if you're trying to get on your own, you can go to upworks.com um, then, and then you can go and um, kind of search for uh, like administrative assistance. It's not, it's not that hard to find. Like they're pretty easy, uh, pretty affordable. Um, and then for me, I also claim for home office. So I have all my logins for um, like my utility bills and everything. And then I put on a calendar, like just, I have her in the beginning of each year, go log in, go download everything, go track it for me and then put it on my mileage stuff so that it makes it easier for Tony to handle. Mm -hmm. You just, I have a lot of things on my credit card, you know, a lot of things from my bank statements. So I mean, how do you avoid, I mean, you know, I, I how do you avoid like personal information, bank account numbers and, and things like that leaking out? Um, you don't have access to my bank account numbers. So um, with my wave app, so I, for my, all of our, all of my business, I have um, a very specific bank account, a specific checking account just for that business or my real estate. And I have a one, one or two credit cards that I only use for it. So I'm only sharing with her with my business things and not really the my personal stuff. Um, and then like, again, she doesn't have access to my actual bank statements and all of that. She has um, it through Wave, which is automatically connected. However, I personally don't really care um, because like, what is she going to do with it? I still have another VA that I use just for um, like credit card reconciliations. And I just send them my bank statements and they'll, they'll finish the work for me. But like, I don't, I haven't really cared too much about like my business account for the security part, like, because they don't, they don't have the ability to actually physically move money in or out. But I don't think it's super secure. Mm -hmm. If Tony has an idea about that. Tony, do you have other ideas? Um, I probably would say the biggest one would probably be if you want if you want to put in the legwork, you could run it through some AI tool to um, redact it all, redact the account numbers, and then send it over if you want to do that. Um, so that's the biggest thing. Um, the as for like the personal expenses, yeah, I probably would start to start sifting away into a business card, business credit card, business uh, bank account, and then that way they won't have you know can't see any of the personal stuff. But if you want to redact everything, that that'd probably be the next best area. Um, for you to do. Um, but, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of the folks, you know, that are, you know, VA wise, you know, they're, you know, they're very hungry in terms of like, you know, what they're down to, you know, they're probably grateful for the opportunity to. So I don't think they would, at least I, you know, I know <laughs> they wouldn't take your info just because I'm assuming that, you know, the rates that you're paying them, it's easy to, you know, overpay them for that trust and confidence to be your go-to person. So, yeah, it's like a, it's a good concern though. Don't get me wrong. Is this may or may not depends on the person though, right? I mean, even you use a U.S. person, there could be good people, bad people, <laughs> uh, also. I think it's also in in terms of pricing of how how much they usually charge. Um, it depends on um, if you're getting them through like in a VA agency or a hub. They those can go up really between eight to twelve dollars. And then if you're able to hire the freelancers, sometimes off of um, the Facebooks or up um, Upworks or online jobs at Philippines uh, or .ph, then those are like sometimes around like $5 to about $8. So, um, and they're only as good as you, how you train them and what systems you have in place. Just letting you know, like you can't just hire them and expect them to know everything about you and how to organize your stuff. You have to set up the structure and the system first because they're just going to do like the paperwork based on how you ask them to do. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hey, Tony, speaking of bookkeeping, if I have three rental properties, I've kind of been running it through like one savings account off my personal, but I've been thinking next year, like actually creating like to buy Wells Fargo now, go to a Chase and have like three separate accounts for each um, property to have so I can easy for audit. Is that kind of a good practice? There, nothing's on an LLC. It's all under my name, but oh, is yeah. that probably good practice? Oh, yeah, yeah. You Then you're building the 
key components needed to uh, 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 if you want to offshore whatever. So, you know, because then they can know, hey, bank account 9831 is this property, 9832 is that property. So it actually makes it super clean and easy. Yeah. You know? So yeah, if you're if you're able to deal with it, that'd be that'd be awesome um, to have that multiple separation too. I do that already. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. The other thing I saw people doing is, I think ReliefFi, you can open up like a crap load of online accounts for this purpose. What's this ReliefFi thing? Re uh, ReliefFi. Um, I think Eric, you uh, mentioned it to me. So it's a uh, it's it's an online bank, just like yeah. how Mercury, you can open up like a crap load of like uh, accounts. Ally, you can open up a crap load yeah. of accounts. Um, so. Up to you. you could do too, but like let's just have that the stupid limit. So if you're doing the online banking, they yeah. uh, tend to not have like a minimum amount that you have to keep. Oh yeah, the fifteen bucks. <laughs> yeah. Fifteen hundred if it's like through Chase or Wells oh, Fargo. Oh, oh isn't it fifteen bucks if you fall underneath it? Uh yeah, it's like twelve to fifteen dollars a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then like if it's an ally bank or um Capital One, uh th th those are like cheap. Those are like free. I yeah. Love Exactly. Tony, I have to do a little bit of my own homework, but I was just curious um, for logging my hours, mm -hmm. what are like some big things like for the short-term rental? Like, I know like maybe like setting up my Airbnb, talking to clients or um, oh, yeah. maybe doing Calvin school. Would those count? Uh, so schooling is like controversial on that side, but um, if you just go up to the property, set up everything, um, that's going to get you a good chunk of hours. So setting okay. up everything, um, um, getting pictures, writing the copy, um, doing the pricing, setting up the software, setting up the automations. Um, those things will probably get you the, the hundred hours that you need and then communicating with your guests too. Um, so then coordinating with cleaners, um, that's always the big one too. Um, supplies and then a little bit of bookkeeping on, on top of it all too. get all the paperwork together. So that would be, you know, some activities that will easily be able to go in there. But I'd say for you, almost bring it in naturally. Anytime you're touching or um, doing anything with that property, just start the clock right away. That's the easiest way to naturally do it all too. Okay, cool. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Tony, how can friends get in touch with you? What's your, can you drop your contacts in your oh. website or form? Like, say if someone wants to schedule a call or a booking with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, just uh, hit the, no, I'll just type it in the cpadu.com. Um, and then, all right, that's my own website, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the cpadu.com. And then just hit us up there, um, submit a form. And then, yeah, we'll get you uh, ran through, go through the discovery process with the team, uh, see what we can evaluate will be the right fit, find you some tax savings, and then uh, teach about our process. And if you're interested in TikTok or IG, he actually drops a lot of um like these, the tips that we were talking about right now, he puts them up on social media in like bite-sized format. So anyone with ADD or short attention span, they can pick up something and learn too. Uh, yeah. Everything's, yeah, everything is the CP dupe. So yeah, pretty easy to find. I think I have the same logo on everything. It's just this, the, 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 this thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. That was me when I had more hair. Yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My fiance. Were you wearing right glasses back then or a bra? <laughs> yeah well you know pick 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 it's an open for interpretation yeah i was like it looks more like a bra to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right any more questions you guys because usually you know if you get him or as another cpa that's just for your questions they're like 350 dollars an hour so like i'm hella asian and that's why i keep volunteering to, to do things for us <laughs> <laughs> take advantage of this man and he knows what's up. Merry Christmas, right? <laughs> That's my Christmas present from him. And I'm 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 using it on to all of you guys. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. All right. Sounds well, good. Thank, thank you guys so much for sticking around this whole week. This was a pretty good and long session. And there was so much information that we learned. Hopefully you guys took really good notes or jotted down terms of information that um that we talked about. But don't worry, I did record this. I will be sending this out probably tomorrow. I need some time to get all this uploaded and cleaned up, but I will email it out to everyone. But until then, happy holidays, happy new year. Hope you guys make a shitload of money in 2024. Thank you, everyone. Take Thank care. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Take care.